And here we are. Welcome back to the Virtual Railroader Academy. As always, I'm your host, Professor Casey. And I'm Professor Nick, and we are very happy to once again welcome you to Railroaders Play Railroader. I got yes. the game right this time. You, you did get the game I right this game time. Right. Uh, I didn't get the stream title right, which someone has just messaged me, so I'm fixing that. Um, let's see, what are we tonight? We are um, youth in railroading. 207 as our course number for this evening to stick with the academic theme. And tonight we are joined by two incredibly special guests that I'm thrilled to have on the show. We have Orion from the Naugatuck Railroad and Ricky from the TVRM. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, so, um, yeah, tonight we're going to be talking all about being young and being into trains and getting involved and what the industry is like and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Yes. Tonight, we are young. So we'll set the world on fire. Or and... set a steam locomotive on fire. <laughs> and well, there... the engine, but you, you get where we're going with this. <laughs> there we go with our first dad joke of the evening. Oh, people are saying there's no sound. Oh, nope, there is sound. Okay. There we go. Um, yes, so uh, our train for this evening is shoving into the station. Uh, we're going to be going on a nice little passenger excursion uh, as uh, we talk because there is way too much to talk about to be able to uh, successfully run a switching operation and hold a conversation at the same time. Um, so that's, you know, that's that's all good for safety right there is to uh, do all of those things at once and fail and wreck as we're good at. Right, Nick? Uh, yes, I, I as I have way too much experience. And, ooh, I like that we have an open air car. We have. Uh, have you gone up? It. Have you gone up to the front? Uh, no, no, I'm gonna. You, you, you should. You should go take a look at the Cindergon. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is a I proper it. northeast uh, train. You know, we've we've got a small steam engine ish, with a Cindergon, some open vestibule coaches, a uh, steel coach, a baggage, and an house at the, the end for no reason. Engine. We yep, do, we do have the correct engine number for this. Oh, we, always memeing here. Mm -hmm. um, no, this, this check gets out. This, uh, I think this gets the the Lynn mode in or Andy Muller. Uh, who else do I need to throw in that bunch? Uh, Howard Pincus uh, seal of approval. Yeah. Well, Orion, uh, Orion, you could probably tell us better than anybody if this would get Howard seal of approval. Oh yeah, if, if, if it's small, uh, hey, remember he he was uh, he was there for the Chessy Steam Special, and the the running joke is he fired for Moses, so he's seen it all, um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm sure it would have his approval. All right, uh, uh, I think I'm gonna go park up in the Cindergon up front, and uh, we're just we're waiting on our dispatcher to give us permission out. So, um. We're young, we like trains, we're all involved in railroading here in some degree or another. Um, uh, oh. Orion, let's start with you. How did you get your start in all of this? Well, I got my start, I, I, I blame my parents. Uh, my mother was actually a volunteer at the Northern Pacific Railway Museum in Toppenish, Washington. A cool place, underrated if uh, nobody's heard of it. Give them a, you know, check it out in Toppenish, Washington. And uh, that's where I'm originally from. So she was a volunteer and uh, would set up a layout, a Lego layout actually, before the Lego train market was, is what it is today. And you know, we're talking like, you know, 2005. And uh, hmm. she, she set up a, for their toy train Christmas event, a, a Lego, Lego train layout. Uh, and uh, we, uh, she was an engineer uh, student engineer uh, there, so I got to ride in their 65 tonner from a very young age, uh, and uh, you know, witness her uh, navigate navigate the rail the little uh, switching operation they have there and their Christmas event and uh, things of that nature. So that's how I really got exposed to it very on uh, a weekend basis. And uh, when we moved out uh, to Connecticut in the Northeast, she kind of uh, stepped 
uh, stepped away from the uh, train the train thing and I kind of took over uh, a lot of people know me for moving a box car from actually where I currently work uh, to my parents backyard and and fighting the town on it and the neighbors and restoring it now that's at the uh, the Danbury Railway Museum and that's really what drew me back into the whole the whole train scene I would say and uh, stayed in contact uh, with the Railroad Museum in New England and uh, the Monongatuck Railroad. And uh, when I graduated school, it landed me a job. I was working at a sign company, um, which was a great experience. And now my full-time job, and it has been now for over four years, hard to believe, is is working here in in Thomaston, Connecticut. So I attribute a lot of it to my my parents, actually, and to my mother for for being supportive and. Uh, uh, you know, starting her involvement, which then in turn, you know, started my involvement. That's that's awesome that you have that family connection to it. That's that, I, I love hearing stories like that. Um, Ricky, how about you? I too blame my my parents, or at least my dad, um, who we also grew up in Washington, um, and from a young age, like we would chase trains. Um, for those of you who throw back, there was a, uh, a dinner train that ran out of Renton, Washington, the Spirit of Washington dinner train. And that was, I remember just, that. Mm, yeah, that was just a few minutes from where I grew up. So my dad and I would chase it like every, every day, his office was right next to it. Um, and then he found out about the Chehalis and Trelia railroad about an hour and a half south of where we lived. And we had a motor home. So he started going down there to volunteer and learn how to be in operations and I would go with him and we started when I was six and uh, because I was so young I could go with him like in the motorhome for the whole weekend you know and then uh, he got involved with what's now HRA it used to be called train and uh, started taking me with him on the conventions because when you're a kid you can leave school for a week and no one cares there's no pile of homework um, and eventually he was president of it. So I got to go to all these conventions and meet all these people that really I, I kind of grew up with. And um, I still just kind of stuck with Chehalis. I ended up getting a degree in computer programming. And um, I want to be a mechanical engineer, but I'm really dyslexic and like numbers are not my thing. I mess up my letters. It's just a hard time being in school in general. Um, but I digress. Computers tell you what you do wrong when you're programming it'll underline it you're like oh yeah okay um so eventually got tired of that and at one convention i was talking to stephen butler and he was like i'll hire you in alamosa if you want so i just up and left my job went to alamosa started working in a steam shop and that was really awesome um but uh it was iowa pacific mm. i'm, and we I'm all so have sorry <laughs> they uh, they tried changing my benefits agreement six months into it to basically say we're not going to ever give you any and oh, that geez. was at the same time yeah um, that was at the same time that the Lone Ranger needed another person and it was just a few hours away so uh, Jason Lamb called me up and said do you want to come be part of the Lone Ranger crew so I left Alamosa and went to go work on the Lone Ranger um, for a few months and then I went back to programming as a um, database developer for like five years and really had an opportunity to travel across the country for a different office position out of Atlanta and I had always wanted to learn coal so I said the heck with it why not you know um, totally changed my life moved across the country and then right as I got to Atlanta my position was eliminated Oh, and yeah, um, and it was for it was for Starbucks actually at the time it was the corporate office. So to keep my benefits, I started working in the store, which is no fun to be honest. Um, and uh, started tried tried to volunteer at TVRM, and then ended up getting a call that said, you know, we know you had an engineer's license. Do you want to come work for us part time instead of going through the volunteer hoops? And I said I'd love to. And then COVID hit and Starbucks laid me off. And uh, I went to George Walker, who we all miss, and uh, said, here's the situation. I mean, I'd 
I love it here. I've been working under part-time status, but I've been putting in 40 hours a week anyways, you know, is this something you'd consider is bringing me on full time? And he made it happen with it a couple of days. And I've been there ever since. And I love, love TBRM. So that's the short condensed version. <laughs> wow. I, 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 like I've known you've done a lot. I didn't realize how young you started and how involved you've been in the, in the HRA. Um, like this entire time um, yeah i was on the board for a little bit but i just uh, it was when i moved over here too and i've been driving and um it's just been a lot so i stepped down so like i can't commit any time to anything right now outside of just normal life um, but i do like most people that are there have known me since i was i think we started going when i was eight and i'm 37 now so that's, That's the networking ability within rail preservation is really there. It, it's amazing who knows who because just because somebody's in one part of the country doesn't mean they've spent a lot of time in another part of the country and you can, can and you might know people that you didn't know you know. Yep. Uh, I, I'm constantly blown away by the networking and just meeting new people and having conversation. It's like, oh, you, you know them? Like, oh, I know that. And then, like, all of a sudden you have, like, a new best friend halfway across the country that you didn't know five minutes ago, but you know all the same people and you're surprised you've never met. Yeah, and, I, sorry uh, to cut you off, Lula. I mean, I think that's, like, what HRA, I mean, I met some wonderful people this year uh, in, in Canada from... Uh, from California and uh, now they're with the Oregon coast so uh, when I plan my trip next year in April you now I got another another group of people to go see and meet in Oregon I was just gonna say for those of you who are uh, listening now that you know a little bit more about our guests feel free to we have some questions of our own for them but if you have additional questions that you'd like to submit uh, we'll be keeping track of those and ask them probably yes. a bit later in the um, no, it's, I love that you end up, like, with rail, like, I don't, I don't even want to call it rail fan vacations, but networking vacations where, like, oh, I'm going here. It's like, oh, I know someone, look, like, give, shoot them a message, give them a call, see if they're in town. Let me go say hi while I'm out there. Uh, it, it, I don't know. It makes traveling more fun for me of getting to pop in, see friends, check out a new operation uh, while I'm off doing other stuff. That's when I drove across the country to move to Atlanta, I stayed, I hit up Travis Stevenson, who's also on the board, but he, um, he hasn't been to all the conventions cause he's running Boone Scenic. And, mm -hmm. uh, but he was also a kid at the convention. We were the only kids together. So he's like an older brother. And I was like, Hey, can I stay, you know, stay with you? So I slept at his house on the way to Atlanta but then the next day I rode his railroad for the first time and it's just it's really easy to make connections with people in this industry because we're all passionate about the same thing and typically uh, a majority of the people are willing to step up and help the other person out yeah and I, I find that sense of community is really nice um and I think social media, with how it's grown, has really helped that a lot. Plus, like, now I can, like, I have friends everywhere, and, like, we talk, but I can blast out a message on Discord, Facebook, hell, even Twitter sometimes, of, like, man, I, like, my bibs broke. I, I need new bibs that aren't Carhartt. And, like, jump into a bunch of different conversations about, like, what's the best workwear to get. Um, or like, hey, I'm going out here to, I'm going out here on vacation. What's around here to check out? And get recommendations from people local to the area about like museums they like, little like, you know, like little depot things in a town that have a cool little display about the, like, I don't know, that, that type of camaraderie connection um, networking is, I, I think we're kind of in a golden age for that. Uh, Boone Scenic is on my short list. I have my soft spot for my Chinese steam engines. I really want to get out there. And I know. I Quite a rebuild. Uh, I want to get out there and see that thing. So, uh, Ryan, something that uh, you touched on, but you have more to expand there. I know 
It it started with the box car, and then it kind of grew from there, didn't it? The box car is not the only thing you have in your possession. No, um, and as I as I like to say, the you know, and the word of railroads, stay tuned. Uh, but yes, I uh, the the box car was the first first piece of equipment. A year or two after that, a state of Connecticut auction came about with something I knew nothing about. And now I know a lot about, and even more in recent months. Uh, the uh, seldom powered vehicles by the Bud Company, the SPVs, which were rebuilt by Amtrak and converted mm. into Amfleet, basically. Um, very underrepresented. And uh, I ended up winning one of those at a state auction. Uh, and I ended up with uh, the Oddball, which was a conference car made for uh, Governor Rowland. It was at the State Street Station Grand Opening, et cetera, et cetera. It's been to disaster relief at Hurricane Katrina. It's transported the ice hockey teams up to Montreal. It's an interesting car. It, 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 there was a lot of parties on it in between 1995 and 2005. It had a very short service life. Um, after the state got uh, stainless steel cars from overseas, uh, they retired them, parked them, and the last thing they were used for was uh, disaster relief for Hurricane Katrina. And uh, so they sat, they sat in New Haven Yard. Uh, the last time they were serviced was 2008. Uh, I knew nothing about them, but I went and surveyed, you know, what little knowledge I had of passenger cars at the time and decided that, you know, this is the one. If I'm, I'm going to buy one, this is going to be it. And uh, I was able to borrow some money at, and uh, at like 16, 17 years old and, and, and purchase this, this passion car. Simultaneously, I was working with the uh, RMNE Railroad Museum New England uh, to find a home for the 5111, which was a New Haven parlor car, a bar car that ran into New York. It's an MU car, uh, one of three New Haven MUs left. And uh, uh, that was uh, sold to me and I was able to relocate that the Danbury Railway Museum. So all three cars are still in my possession. Uh, the box car is on long-term uh, loan, uh, long-term lease to the uh, Danbury Railway Museum. Um, there's some stuff going on uh, over there with a, a lot of different equipment, a lot of interesting stuff going on, including some of my own. Um, and it's really been a cool experience because you know, just moving that one passenger car, you meet a bunch of people. And now when you need help, you know, down the road, hey, what kind of air brakes does this have? Uh, you know, how does the air suspension work? Is this, you know, can you set this up, the moving freight? All these, all these questions. You know, here I am calling Atlantic Railways and the people that I met, you know, five years ago. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this, and this. And you can call up Pittsburgh Air Brake and, you know, this is the kit you need and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it's really cool uh, to do that and I didn't realize how much the boxcar would change my life but I, I have the job and and enjoy what I do now because of that um, and I attribute a lot of that to uh, uh, Howard Pincus and his and his willingness to somebody that's 15 years old at a time to have the faith in that to, to continue and that's one thing that I think we're big on the Naugatuck Railroad here is is educating and uh, finding the next generation of who's you know who's going to take this place over eventually and uh you know howard was a big part of that um, so I, I credit a lot of my uh a lot of my uh, successful high school years uh to that and the equipment that followed and uh, he came up to the town hearing and touch on this quick he talked about the challenges and more uh nick well when the neighbors appealed the Planning and zoning permit for this boxcar to be in the yard to be restored. Uh, Howard drove over two hours and came up to the town appeal meeting and spoke at it. And uh, he smiles at me. There was uh, two women from the field hockey team, and he's like, "Don't let them go." The fact that you have two two women here at a boxcar hearing at a town panel from the field hockey team was I could I could only have dreamed of that back in my youth. <laughs> So I really got the community involved with this whole situation. Uh, it, sorry, do you whatever, want to go first, Nick? I was just going to say, whatever opportunities there are 
to bring the non-rail fan public into our field. Whether it be to recruit them as volunteers or so forth, or even just to be able to give them a better understanding of what we're about is always a learning opportunity for everybody, not just for them. I think sometimes we can look at it as, oh, we can teach them about training, but we can learn a lot from them too by way of bringing them in. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that 100%. Um, uh, there's, I've learned a lot from people that have nothing, never seen a train, know very little about about trains. Um, and somebody that we have working for the full time for the Naugatuck Railroad, you know, was a plumber, knew nothing about trains. And I convinced him to put a bid in on a on a uh, project the museum was doing that needed some welding. He was a phenomenal welder. And uh, one thing led to another. He's he's full time now as our machine, you know, our, as our fabricator. Uh, and I went, you know, I met him originally on a school bus. So once again, nothing about trains. Didn't really have a big interest. To, had enough of an interest to be curious about it. But you know, it's amazing how much, you know, his life has changed because of that boxcar project. Uh, now, I, I, you mentioned um, the getting younger people involved and how much the boxcar brought people into the Nagi. Um, and we were talking a little bit about this before the stream, but just kind of the the age discrepancies or not discrepancies in someone's case here um throwing off the statistics of our, our of our respective railroads and um we, we were remarking uh orion and i how um you know it seems like there's people in their 50s and there's a weird gap in the 40s late 30s there's some people in the early mid 30s and then there's a lot of people in their mid early late 20s or mid late 20s getting involved right now and um how nice it is to see that breath of fresh air and starting to see signs of how is the handoff going to happen uh to the next generation which is uh i, I know something at my railroad that's actively being talked about um, right yeah you know, what, what are your guys' experience uh with the uh the kind of like how your railroad's evolving and prepping for that handoff and the, the young folks coming in. Uh, Ricky, you want to uh, take... I, I have some comments well, on it. You want to take this one? I'm sitting here pondering um, because PVRM is such a large business now. Um, we're really looking for all types of workers here and um, well, we already have a lot of 20 year olds on staff in the shop and um, we have a lot of 30 year olds and 40 year olds on uh, all departments i mean we have we're we're kind of the exception here because so i'm sitting here trying to have, put it in perspective so if i go back to volunteer days when i was younger uh it was it was also completely different there wasn't any social media there wasn't not really um you had myspace back then um, What's my? So space? I don't. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that hurts. Yeah, I know. Uh, no, I know what it is. Um, so I don't know. I I don't know that I can take this one because I haven't been part of a volunteer group in so long that my perception has kind of evolved on on that. Here, you, we're very much a big business, so hard to hard to say. Oh, I just realized mm. none of us are volunteers we're all paid employees of our organizations and i i volunteer at the oh that's right I you do volunteer twice a year so i <laughs> don't call me don't call me a full-fledged volunteer Vol diet volunteer at the pennsylvania trolley museum um we don't bring in any volunteers though anymore pretty much for basically for insurance reasons almost every single person we have it for the most part unless it's some major event uh, or they've been grandfathered in, but we very rarely have volunteers now. Interesting. At, at the Naugatuck, um, and, you know, just to backstory, because I know there's a lot of people listening in that, you know, don't, maybe have never even heard of us, uh, which is possible. There's people that live in town that still don't realize that there, there's a train here. Wow. Uh, but what's, what's kind of interesting is, 
So the Railroad Museum of New England owns 100% of the Naugatuck Railroad Company, which is a full-fledged common carrier railroad, railroad retirement. I'm in railroad retirement. Any employee of the railroads in railroad retirement. Um, and we haul freight and we haul passenger. And it's all overseen. I mean, it, the museum is, is the owner of the railroad. Um, but that, that it makes a unique challenge because you have the membership of the museum and uh, volunteers uh, that want to, want to be involved. And there is a volunteer base. Um, so most of our trains are actually 50-50. Uh, the train crew itself is generally paid, um, you know, because of the uh, uh, railroad retirement regulations that go with, you know, the drug testing and all that. Um, but for example, we have, uh, you know, some pretty talented uh, volunteers that do work in the shop, that uh, uh, car host, uh, tickets, retail. Uh, we have people that just come down for very specific trains. They're really interested in the barbecue and whiskey train, and we need people to help to help serve on board the train, and they'll come out for that, uh, things of that nature. One challenging thing that I found is trying to navigate, recruit, and manage all of these volunteers and volunteer projects. And I think that's a downfall of a lot of organizations. Somebody walks into the organization, I want to volunteer, and we're not perfect either. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, where do you put them? How do you start them? And that's a, that's part of the challenge. Um, so the museum and its board is looking into uh, volunteer coordinator, um, you know, going in a direction of maybe an executive director to help with that situation because we have a very unique uh, um, divide. But I think everybody except for maybe one of the railroad employees started with uh, started as a volunteer for the museum. I mean, I was a car host on the Christmas train when I, when I was 15, and uh, you know now it's my job. So it's kind of interesting. There's a, there's a way to grow if you're if you're truly interested, um, and I think that's what makes us unique. And you know, I, I really it really puts a smile on my face because I know at the end of the day that you know the nonprofit is is benefiting from me being here, and uh, you know that that mean that means a lot to me, and uh, you know the whole thing about preserving New England railroad history is we have a lot of neat stuff here, but you have to really make the business successful if you want to have, you know, the preservation and be successful as well. Yeah, I... No, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ricky. Let's say one of the, this uh, touches on the... Uh, at Heritage Rail, we had a seminar that was, I can't remember what it was called, youth maintaining or retaining youth volunteers or, or something like that. It was basically an open panel of, of approaching, um, getting and keeping younger volunteers. And it really, like, I saw so many parallels in a business. And from a management perspective, they're not just volunteers, but treat them as though they were employees too. Find out what drives them, find out what they're interested in, um, and like, quote unquote, hire them for that specific position and then have reviews with them and check in with them just like you would an employee and uh, keep following up set goals. And it, it, I found I saw a lot of parallels during this discussion. I'm like, well, if we treated them like employees and had some sort of employee plan, um, you have a lot of success because then the volunteers feel heard. They feel like there's growth. They feel like they have an opportunity to voice if they want to work on something else. Um, so I think a lot of that had a lot of val a validity to it. Um, no, I, I, I get that. Um, one of the first places that I started out at um, on the with 142, it was very much the CMO treated it very much like a business of like, what do you want to learn here? What do you, what do you want to know? And approached it with the mentality of like you're young we're going to teach you you're hopefully going to get good at what you do and you're going to go off and you're going to work somewhere making money and be successful and thought of it as a um teaching opportunity and a place to go learn before you got a job at a, a, at, a, at a paid tourist railroad on class two on a class three um and as a way to grow as a person um but also like you're helping out the organization and 
I know as someone young starting out, I really appreciate of I really appreciated that of like I'm learning skills that I can use for anywhere for life. Um, you know, I got you know, really fell in love with painting coaches. Um, weirdly enough, I found it being very zen. So like became a better paint just repainted my bathroom by myself, which I never thought I'd do because of the skills I learned doing that. Um, and you know, that's aside from metalwork, starting to learn how to weld, um, assisting when we're doing um, stable replacements and helping the welder out and being the person to hand off stuff and kind of watching and learning. And I, you know, I, I, I felt like I really grew as a person because of doing stuff exactly like that, of treating it like a job and having like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to do? How do you want to grow? Mm -hmm. And I think that even though organizations could differ as far as how strong their volunteer component is, a common thread is the idea that these are entities and demonstrating that these are entities that people, rail fans and non, can really become established with if they invest. That they can develop and grow uh, skills through it. So if it's volunteer, they may not be directly building their career through it, but they could still be building skills that could apply to their career depending on what they are looking to develop within that volunteer role. I think having a volunteer coordinator is super helpful uh, in general. If you don't have one, uh, if you're in a position to create a role for that, and have that that person basically treating being that that manager that oversight checking in and having those reviews are are going to keep your volunteers interested in, and and focused and and wanting to come back to learn something new or you know any any of that so a uh, question from bring up my notes okay from more trains please well that's a request we can honor uh, i'm yes. going into university and i'd like to volunteer for some local operations but i don't know if i'll be able to contribute enough of my time to really help out should i wait until i'm out of uni or are there any other ways i could help out who wants to take uh, a stab uh, at that one first guess. yes I guess, uh, I mean, I, I can go ahead and yeah, uh, go for explain it. a little bit about that. Um, what's, what's interesting is uh, there was actually, there's actually a program and you may be able, I don't know where this individual is from, but you may be able to look at your local community college, even if you're not attending it. Some of these have uh, uh, some, some, connect, some connection, meaning uh, to a railroad or have a program for example, in Connecticut, we had a Gateway Community College, uh, mm. had a railroad program, and uh, that's actually where uh, one of our employees is from because he started as a, a volunteer interested in uh, in the train and, and, and working on locomotives and, and whatnot. And you know, I took them out in a high rail truck, and you know, here's the railroad, uh, and, and this is what it's about. And uh, I think finding that in your community is, is the key part to that. Um, but most volunteer organizations have a section of their website, volunteer form. You know, a lot of places don't, will require you to be a member if you are gonna volunteer even for a day because of insurance purposes. Uh, so I, I think really it's a matter of, you have to be the one that reaches out to them uh, because a lot of rail organizations Unfortunately, barely have enough people to keep keep the place running, let alone do outreach. Um, and uh, so that, that's what I would recommend is one, see if your college or other colleges in the area have something related to that. But if not, be willing to make that first move. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good point of, you know, most places barely have enough people to keep the lights on. Even if you can only come out for a couple of days a week or a couple of days a month, um, that's better than not showing up at all. Um, you know, there's a saying amongst my groups of friends and 
if you're a fan of heist, you'll uh, you'll know the saying, but it's go do the thing. Uh, just just go do it. Uh, it's rewarding. It feels good, and even if you can only show up and be a car host occasionally, uh, help paint occasionally, it's just go do it. Um, and and find out their like work parties. Some you know, it might not be operating days that they need your help. It might that they're putting together a Tuesday night painting party or you know whatever so reach out find out what their what their work structure is like and what they need and whatever you can do they'll they'll appreciate yeah absolutely that yeah. our uh, our nonprofit attachment uh has wednesday night work party smack in the middle of the week and when we're running steam and we're running it five days a week wednesday nights are that that's the fire up day so the volunteers get to help out a little bit with fire up but they're also there working on their projects helping keeping the fleet running uh working on display stuff so it's even if it's not during the week, even if it's not on trains, there's always something to do, and there's usually something going on during the week. That's a that is an excellent question. Thank you for that. A number one thing is approach them and ask, uh, approach and, and explain what your limitations are, and and see um, what their feelings are towards being able to work with you, because all of it's hypothetical until you actually go and talk to them and and determine what's going to be in uh, the mutual interest. A hundred percent. Um, let's see. So oh, I, I had one of the questions. Uh, we all started out at kind of very different times in the industry and at different ages. Um, so what was it like when you were starting out as someone young, getting involved and dealing with the, this new culture that you were kind of thrown into? Um... I guess, uh, yeah, I think uh, Ricky's and I's uh, answers will be similar but different, uh, which would be cool. Uh, my answer is, as I touched on earlier, I said one of it, and I think we've slowly started to get away from this uh, in the industry, as a, in the preservation industry as a whole. Um, even, uh, you know, railroads in general have become more, um, in my opinion, more marketable uh, in, in the last couple of years. But I, I started out obviously as a, as a volunteer for the for the railroad news in New England, and having that willingness from that organization at the time to be willing to take somebody in, and this is a train, and this is what we do, and um, willing to let you be hands-on and get involved uh, is step number one. So if you're approaching an organization, and you know that like putting you in the bathrooms to clean the bathrooms and you know up the new people got to do this um that's not the right fit for you uh i would recommend if you got it there's every state i am sure has at least one or two railroad organizations in this country um or regionally so you know if that's the case i would recommend finding a place that's open and uh warming and be patient you're not going to get a conductor certification overnight. Uh, you're not going to be uh, necessarily doing everything you want to be doing. But uh, patience is key, I think, in especially with just starting out. And uh, even if you're, a, let's say, a certified conductor at one railroad and you go to a new railroad, it doesn't mean to show up and make it look like you own the place. You know. Their training and conductor and engineer purposes might be completely different than 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 where you're coming from. So I think keeping an open mind when you're starting out is uh, number one. And when I when I started uh, learning to do that and uh, having the organization willing to teach and be patient and learn is key. And I think that's the flaw to some of these rail organizations is that. That they're maybe not patient enough or they're not willing to really engage in new members because let's say the older generation they want to be the ones on the trains and you know not necessarily allow the new people on um, and of course I came into it with social media uh, being around and it was fun you could share with your friends hey I'm at the I'm at the railroad this weekend and these are all the cool things we're doing and uh, for me, I mean, you know, some people 
I would say in high school is like, well, that's kind of uncool, but you make it fun. It doesn't really matter what other people think as long as you're having a good time. And, uh, you know, I was. And I, I think that's another point, too, is make sure that you're enjoying it. And that goes back to what I first said. If you're not enjoying it or you're not feeling welcome, it might be time to find a new place. 100%. Yeah, don't, don't feel like you need to stay in a place that's not treating you right. Um, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself either, but don't stand up for yourself too much also. Because um, that's also problematic. And I'll build off of Orion's uh, point about uh, looking to join an organization and, and having to keep in mind that you might ha have an immediate... Um, path to being able to get to the end goal like if your end goal is ops and being on the right side of a steam locomotive you're going to have a, a long way to get there i so i agree with orion on that i would add though that you should with any organization press them as to what the pathway forward to whatever your end goal is looks like because there are some that will say oh yeah we're looking for x or y that i've experienced personally that don't do a great job of illustrating what that path is. They'll say, oh, we've got a training for this, but then it's never clear when the training's happening or how you qualify to get in the training or anything like that. So making sure that your your volunteer coordinator or whoever is kind of in the supervisor role with the organization is giving you clear direction on here's what it takes to get to the next step. Here's the investment from you that we're looking at. Um, and here's what you can expect from us. It, it's a two way street in that regard. Mm -hmm. An organization and both, both of my railroads now have clear written out um, kind of step by step, how to advance to like, how, how do you become an engineer? What qualifications do you need? what's the training criteria in order to get there. And that's very important for an organization to have. So that way young people coming in, see what the way forward is. Now, I, I'm going to put Ricky on the spot here. What was it like? Um, and I, I'm more, I, I can almost, Ricky, if you're right, fit, I'll tack on another question. Um, it, I, I give I give Ricky a lot of credit um, for being involved even younger than I was, number one, but also being, um, and I think this has changed a lot here, but being a woman in railroading even 10 years ago, I think that whole perception has changed a lot in the last 10 years, and at least um, from, from even when my mother was uh, involved, she was one of two you know, in the, in the organization. So I would kind of like to hear a little bit about that if you're all right talking about it. Yeah. Um, it, um, trying not to figure out how to phrase this, but I think that the only reason that I stuck around was because my dad was involved where I got started. Um, they were not, I mean, a lot of them were like older brothers to me. The older upper management was of the opinion that I should not be participating, um, to say it politely, but I just kept showing up and I kept doing the work. And I really wanted to learn the mechanical side of things and uh, it didn't really pan out. Um, so I followed my heart and went elsewhere where I could get mechanical training but even then everywhere I've gone there's been some pushback to some degree and you just kind of have to have an understanding that other people have their own um, judgment and unhappiness to deal with and so they project and you have to just power through it but at the end of the day I'm doing what I want to do I love my job. I am now at a place where I'm fully supported. But uh, I know some of you know this story, but it wasn't even that long ago um, where I started at TVRM 
and I don't know if I'm allowed to swear or not, but I'd like to quote it. I know oh, you, you guys you, know you, the story. You, you, can, you can swear. Oh, cool. We, uh, this this uh, is Railroaders. Cursing is encouraged. Well, yes. Okay. Well, I've been polite, but um, my first day on the payroll at, at Tennessee Valley, I took a selfie in the cab at the 630. They had cut a shovel to my armpit height because the one that was in the 01 is like as tall as my head and it was killing my shoulder. Jesus um, Christ, that's a big shovel. It was it was ridiculous. I was like, why am I having to swing my arm way back to try and like, and I hadn't fired yet. I had no idea what I was doing yet, but they, they like one of the guys took the time to make me a shovel that fit so that it was easier to learn. And I don't, my post was like, I'm so grateful to be here. I love it. I'm so excited, whatever. Somebody in my Facebook friends list, quote unquote, uh, took a screenshot of it, turned it into a meme, and then posted it in a private group. And it said, the face you make when you don't realize you're only here for your tits and ass. And that was just four years ago. So have we made it come a long way? Absolutely. Are there still people out there that will hunt you down because you're a woman and for some reason that's threatening? Sure. Uh-huh. Um, but at work, now I'm with such a like we are like family and we utilize each other's strengths and I'm smaller compared to a lot of other people so I'm the one doing the boiler internals with the FRA whereas my boss is like 6'5 and like his shoulders are twice as large as I am so when I can't get something I'm like hey large human come help me and um, we really played off of each other's strengths that way and they're super supportive and you just I don't know it's 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 one of those things you just even if you're not a woman, I don't care if you go somewhere and somebody's being a jerk. You just if it's making you happy to be working on it and you're getting reward, you keep you just keep powering through and those curmudgeons will eventually fade out. Mm-hmm. Um similar experience and I think what was helpful was like you said, having people who kinda of watched out for you and watched your back. Um my first forever there are still people that I talked to who would watch out for me and help me out and show me things when I was getting passed over because I was a woman. Um, and that, even at my current railroad, you know, I joined, um, I was immediately made a fireman because I was already a fireman for a number of years already and kind of jumped ahead of the line and that pissed people off. And there are people who are like, no, like she knows what she's doing. She's, she's good. And um, being able to use, you know, not the strongest person in the shop, not the, not the strongest fireman, so not small, so I don't have the muscle to hit the front corners with my with root strength, so it's learning how to fire differently and being able to take those things that I've learned and teach them to new firemen of like, all right, no, you don't use strength, use momentum to be able mm-hmm. to hit the front corners and um, being able to take my experience as a woman and use that to show other people different ways of firing that aren't what everyone else has shown with everyone else is showing i think that's uh an advantage yes there there are advantages and and disadvantages as seen from from outsiders who don't you know they'll use it as an excuse rather than actually get to know you and understand whether or not can you do the job that's what it comes down to you know Uh, they'd rather just you said disadvantage and my mind immediately went to like yeah and disadvantage having getting stuck doing shoe and wedge jobs in between the frame all, like oh no not that kind of disadvantage got it oh no <laughs> <laughs> um and but still quickly, disadvantage and you guys touch on a very important point you know the sense of and back to my earlier point about um you know if you, sometimes you have to realize it's time to move on if you know if it continues to be a you know, uh, in a, and more in a volunteer way, but, you know, a, a talks environment. But I give the two of you a lot of credit um, and uh, not to toot my mother's horn, but, you know, being the only woman that was interested at the time uh, to do what she was doing. But it also took the group that was already there to be, you know, to be accepting. And even 20 years ago, I mean, that was 20 years ago, that was that was a rarity and I, I remember like at 10 years old telling people oh you know my my, my mother was a uh, you know friend is a train engineer or did this or did that and they would be like uh you know just look at you with a blank stare and 
the fact that uh, Ricky touched the base on um, community and the people around you and supporting you and having each other's back, uh, that's something that here at, at the Naugatuck we've been able to capture and do well. Um, I think one of my, my favorite examples is we generally hang out with each other outside of, of the organization. Uh, one of my uh, co-workers is moving, so guess what? We all took the day off and we moved, you know, we moved, I hate moving, but we, uh, we moved him out of his uh, apartment and got all the company trucks together. I mean, it was, it was an outing. And, uh, you know, I think that's important. You know, we have, we have something great with, with our people and uh, it sounds like a lot of other organizations have a great group. Uh, unfortunately, and I'm sure we can all name them, there's organizations and even railroad companies out there that unfortunately really, really don't have a, have a great support group or a great group um, or very uh, short-sighted. And, uh, you know, it, it'll all come out in the wash. You know, give it 10 years. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Communities so important. Nick, go ahead. <laughs> well, this is this is a case where I I am a man, but I have very very strong opinions on this, as as followers of the Roundhouse podcast will know. <laughs> um. So the shortest version of my thoughts I can conjure is to say. You know, Ricky, you, you talked about your experience and, and that being from four years ago. My um, adventure into exploring the topic of sexism in rail preservation, which I did on the podcast, um, was two years ago. And, and the short version of that is I put out an anonymous poll for people to submit stories, uh, for women to submit stories of where they might have encouraged um, harassment, um, or sexism or, or negative judgment or, or actors like that. And the stories were were very eye-opening in their own right, but it was also the, the response that I received uh, online. It was very, very mixed. I mean, there were people who got it, people who were supportive. There were people who accused me of lazy and unprofessional journalism. There were people who said that it wasn't scientific enough. I mean, it, it so, even as a as a white straight guy trying to tackle this issue i i received criticism for that and since then it's only hard in my resolve that as as a white straight guy um part of what i should be doing and i think what all of us men should be doing uh is ensuring that we are creating uh, a safe and um, a, a safe environment, uh, a welcoming environment um, for all people, but especially when it comes to recognizing the, the challenges that women have faced in historically into coming into organizations, um, recognizing that those challenges have existed. Uh, and that's not to talk about special, that's not to say special treatment. That's not to say treat them as if they're as, as different. It's to say we need to make sure, we might need to put in extra effort to make sure we are treating them equally. And that's just, that's a self monitoring. That's, you know, that's through conversation. Um, that's for, for me personally, that's about making sure that the, the guests that I have on my podcast come from a diverse background um but and when they do that that what we're talking about is talk, focusing largely on their skill their skill and their experiences and their stories um and only you know, a, occasionally touching on the sort of as a woman what do you think um but that's something that i very strongly feel about that that all of us guys you you joining us here you know, uh, as we're riding our train uh, in railroaders tonight, that's something we can all make sure that we're part of is is creating that better future and create and making sure that we're being properly inclusive. And I think, fortunately, um, when I see the nature of these conversations, I, I see a lot of um, 
emphasis on inclusivity, especially amongst younger uh, preservationists. So I think that the trend is absolutely going the right way, but it's a continual process of, of checking in um, with, with the, those of diverse backgrounds in our organization, um, with our friends to, to make sure that we are doing what we can as allies to this effort. I know that wasn't much of a summary. I have strong feelings, like but <laughs> believe me, that was a summary. <laughs> it, it, it definitely plays into a bigger, um, or, or the same topic really that I'm fairly passionate about and that I, we talked about in this youth seminar at HRA, which was accountability. And it really frustrates me when I don't see people being held accountable for their actions just because, oh, they, they're the expert in this field. We can't run them off. We're going to let them, con we're going to let them continue to be jerks to everybody. We're going to let them continue to make all these remarks. Hey, guess what? You just lost five volunteers because this guy is a total asshole to everybody. And, but you're, you're too afraid to get rid of them or say anything to them or anything. And it drives me crazy because I see it almost every single organization there's one person that you're like i don't know why they're still here but they are <sighs> and <sighs> anyway accountability 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 because that's like if you want retention of good people you have to hold everybody accountable and that's that can be said for for young and not naive but uh inexperienced you know somebody we've uh, all like met that 12 year old that knows everything you know that wants to come in and is really passionate but like they like try and tell you that's not how you do it and so you have to be respectful with them but tell them that what they're saying is also not respectful and that you need to listen to each other and um and you know holding even the younger kids as they grow and learn accountable instead of just running them off i've also seen that too ah we don't like them they're annoying we're gonna run them off instead of teaching them. Hold people accountable. That'll not be the answer to everything, but in my mind it is. <laughs> That's, yeah, any... I've met a lot of new people who are new, they're excited, they're, you know, we were all there. We were young, we were excited, we, we thought we knew everything about trains, and I always try and talk to them, uh, you know, chat with them, Talk, you know, talk to them as professionals um, and when I can get them up into the cab talk about what they're looking at see what they're interested in see what they know see what they want to know um, I think I just saw Nick go yeeting by the train um, <laughs> <laughs> it is sort of difficult when you've gotten when you have the yeeted to get back on that is a, a challenge uh, I'm learning the ways I, this is not my first eating this evening. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, to be able to just talk to them and get them, you know, try, try and be a voice, a, a, an ear to for them to listen to and someone for them to kind of hopefully look up to and um, be able to, I, I don't want to say integrate into the organization better, but uh, I, can't, I can't think of the right word right now. Um, yeah, just... Make sure that they're prepared for the environment. Yes, and make sure thank that, you. That, that uh, mm -hmm. any negative uh, energies or um, attitudes aren't diluting or poisoning that environment. Yes, that. Thank you for finishing my thought. Um, no, I think that's that's super important to kind of make everyone feel welcome, and I do that with new employees, new volunteers. I do that with the general public when I can. We have time in the station. Hey, come on up into the cab. Take a look. Here's what everything does. You have questions about anything? Sit in that seat. Lean out the window. Let your let let mom take a photo of you. Let dad take a photo. Um, to try and keep that interest alive for the next group coming up mm -hmm. behind me. And then every mom on the railroad, every mom with her kids is like, "Oh my god, this is so cool that you're doing it." And I'm like, "Hey, we're hiring. We need firemen." How close do you live? And moms, I I've seen this trend where moms are becoming uh, part of rail organizations because their kids have an interest or because they see it as something positive for their kids. Um, 
and and valuing their, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of our, our mutual uh, friend uh, Lucy Dormont. Yes. Um, it was now the social media. It was the executive director for Meridian Rails uh, in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, and is now the social media manager uh, and development person for the National Model Railroad Association. Uh, hashtag shameless, shameless self promotion. I just interviewed her <laughs> and President Gordy Robinson, so you should totally check that out. But um, uh, other shameless plug: if you join the uh, VRA Discord, um, you can you Nick's all of Nick's uh, podcasts get posted to the Discord when they go live on YouTube, so you can always stay in touch with this content aside from subscribing to his YouTube channel. Shameless plug. Yes. But turning the uh, spotlight back to our, our current guest, simply to say that, yes, I, I think that it, it's great to hear that yours are both organizations that are actively involved in trying to ensure that you have positive, constructive uh, environments um, that are fostering each of your developments um, and that then you and your roles uh, hopefully uh, are having, and maybe this is something that you can talk to, is it, uh, in your role so far, have you found yourself in positions of being able to pass on your knowledge or, um, or your expertise or helping others? I mean, Ryan, you mentioned the the welder that you, you, you were able to help, right? but for both of you, what are other uh, cases in which you're able to apply these philosophies? Yeah, and I, I think that in uh, also applying these skills and uh, in the train, tying it into the community, which is what I talked a lot about at um, HRA, was well, about tying your operation into community and, and different ways to do that. And that, that all starts with one, having the right people. So I, I think going forward, there's a really good, um, I think the industry as a whole is changing and I think it's going in, in the right direction. But, you know, there, there's unfortunately some, uh, there's places that I would really love to see succeed, but they just don't have the right people or the right draw currently to make it happen. Um, and like I said, uh, unfortunately that'll, that will come out of the wash eventually, It'll come out in the wash. Um, and you have to be willing to take chances and organizations have to be willing to take risk and chances and you know there's been some ideas I've had here and thought this would work I would say a passion or train or this event idea and it, 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 it works or it really wasn't good or and you learn from that but you got to be willing to first make that jump and leap of faith because sometimes it backfires on you and sometimes you have like the greatest thing going. I mean, one train that we run is a barbecue and whiskey special that was kind of cut, came together on a napkin inside the station. And we're like, well, let's try it. We got we got the time and, you know, execute it. And now it's one of our very popular events. Um, and we got some really great people involved because of it. Uh, it's just because we're running a barbecue and whiskey train. So. And, and that's a challenge. I know there's a lot of broad, very broad um, group on here. Uh, but that all comes, that all circles back to having the right people, the right group, and being willing to be welcoming um, and having a plan and having it be fun and not, you know, we're just going to put all the volunteers on stripping paint today and we're going to do that for six months people are going to get bored and leave and you know you have to be you have to be aware of that um i just ricky. forgot my thought damn it well well while you're remembering yeah. that ricky how about you uh at tvrm or any of the other uh, entities that you've been part of um for like development we um we've hired welders we usually reach out to our local um, technical college and not for our, like boiler welders but for our everyday uh, fabrication we reach out and we've gotten a few people from the local college and then they end up staying after they graduate 
Um, they've moved on, but they, they stay with us for a while. And then we have a rail camp um, that, that we have a, a varying levels of rail camp. They have like just for the day and they're like six years old and it's adorable uh, uh -huh. for the whole week. They come, they come every day. Um, there's like eight of them with a couple of, of counselors that, that work here and um, and then they get a little bit older and they start spending, you know, longer days or even overnight. And then we have full on teenagers that stay inside one of our cars and the whole day they're doing work type stuff. Um, it could be anything from stripping paint to working on track with the track department or uh, it's, it's kind of <laughs> random, whatever. It's like whatever they feel like tackling, but then they'll go take a train ride up at Hiawatha or um, but we've we have several employees now that are from rail camp and that are just adults and loved it here and so a lot of our development here has been uh, either they grew up here or we reached out to local community but um, again we're kind of unique because we don't have any volunteer events like everyone gets hired but the nice thing is here is that they will train you you don't have to have unless it's for something specific like welding or machining like a lot of our train crew just had no train experience whatsoever and we started them at the bottom and we have several conductors just in the last couple of years that had no experience so that's how kind of we are at, at tvrm uh i remembered my question that i had uh or comment question combo I had for Orion um, and it was uh, you, you mentioned damn it I lost <laughs> it already I'm, I'm and... gonna I'm gonna go over here and Nick you can pontificate on something I've been having a day <laughs> I only had two cups of coffee today instead of three so I'm I'm, I'm doing what I can right now oh well I most certainly can pontificate although i i will again try to, to keep the attention appropriate yes on yes so, <laughs> um <laughs> so with each of your organizations um what what was most surprising um in terms of because so much of, of rail preservation is the gap of what we do perceive it to be like on the inside like when i go to a tourist railroad and i i see the crew at work versus actually being in the inn so for each of you what was what was particularly surprising or or did you not expect when you made that transition from this is something that i'm you know hopping into or uh, to, like it, this is something that i i've see i've seen like you know come up in national discussion or that i have an awareness of to i am part of the thing um well i guess uh, i mean i'll uh you know touch on this um but starting off as a volunteer and my position at at the railroad company has changed or grown um, from when I first started. I mean, I started out on the track, putting, putting ties in the track, and that was a summer track project, uh, and learning about curve geometry. And you know, now I'm a licensed track inspector, but I'm also a licensed conductor as well. Uh, but what my shift more recently has been, and since 21, is uh, taking over the passenger operation, which the general public, I don't think, realizes how much goes into just just at running a scenic train. Everything from getting the crew together, having the ticket server, having... The, I never thought I would be so well-versed in merchant services on the back end of a credit card processing. <laughs> I had no idea what goes on there. And, you know, now I could tell you exactly what uh, what the fee is and who runs this and that there's the middle guy off rise.net and, and it took a long time to transfer certain things over. Uh, so I've learned a lot. You know, I never thought I'd be so well versed in that. I'm insurance. Uh, what it, yeah, we didn't have first class service 
and I was kind of the group that spearheaded that, bringing it in full tilt all year round on our on our trains and converting one of our coaches and restoring it as such and how to market that. Uh, so just running a passenger train, the public, wow, we're doing this barbecue and whiskey train. But it's taken a months of advanced planning and lining everything up and getting the food vendor in line and what's the backup plan and you know the venue space and the bourbon still you know distribution and oh well it's 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 Wednesday and the conductor's you know sick and now we need to find either I'll step in or uh, we need an engineer and you get to call you know the engineer roster and you know, get get people to sign up for the trains and uh, and now there's a, a crisis in the station because it's just like there's so much so much that goes on behind the pasture train it's amazing in the whole the whole railroad in general there's so much and there's every organization has that select group or that core group of people that really make it happen and uh, it, the public doesn't necessarily realize who that is or get to see everything that went on behind the scenes to make it all happen so transforming from a volunteer to track to conductor to now you know really really running the pasture train and, and making a good a good go at it a very good go at it uh has been such a great educational experience uh for myself and made new friends and and new connections and community connections and uh it it you really you learn to build upon it so for me the transition period i didn't it's almost like you don't realize it it was happening uh, but but it was and you know now i can tell you everything there is to know about a, a merchant uh, service account and uh, uh networking with that and look learning how to navigate food and liquor licenses and uh, everything down to that but i just think people don't realize how much actually goes into running a railroad and our and our operation is unique as it is a full class three common carrier railroad tied into running you know a freight and and passenger train and i know tvrm is similar um uh, everything carolina and western now with their passenger uh operation but it's a very unique situation and with unique situation becomes a lot of learning and understanding on how to make it all work. Um, so is, is that to answer your question, Nick? Yeah, and, and how about you, Ricky? I was going to say, you're, you're killing it up there, Orion. You really are. Um, <laughs> luckily, I am not on that side of the business. <laughs> that just, <laughs> I'm the, the grease monkey. And uh, just listening to all the things that you just described, I was like, I'm so tired. Like... <laughs> can't imagine having to juggle all that but at the same time i'm i'm juggling all the mechanical sides so i totally get it um the uh the transition for me was crazy and i can't i don't know that i can pinpoint one thing that really sticks out but shahala centralia was um like the same 15 people most of my life and um the mechanical experience was the guys did the work during the week um, because they were retired and if you wanted to learn anything mechanical you had like not go to work or school if you wanted you know so you just couldn't participate and then when I went to Alamosa I was only there for like six months and literally within the week that I first started the whole shop staff quit <laughs> and moved oh. <laughs> so I was literally in the shop by myself for a while um and that poor engine sat there, you know, I got laid off. Um, I actually went back a second time on, for some stupid reason for like two weeks and then they laid me off. But anyways, um, so but I went back to programming and then when I got to TVRM, I was really just blown away because I had visited in like 2011 and I was like, wow, this place is got it together they got it they got it all like but i had no idea what went into it and, and just how massive it is on the back end we have our own track department we have our own depot 
department. We have our own educational department. We have our own upholstery shop, uh, carpentry shop, uh, a sheet metal shop, um, just all of these factors that go into it. But when I got here for my transition, is uh, I was originally just operations, and I kept asking if I could get in the shop. And within four months, I started working in there. And um, as I developed, my boss was always, I, I'm, I'm pretty straightforward and I just tell you what I'm thinking. And I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to do that. I want to, he's like, you can't learn it all at once. You need to like slow your roll. We'll, we'll get there. And uh, I really wanted to learn diesels because I knew nothing about diesels. And um, I'm still trying to pinpoint like what the the transition for me is, um, but I think it, it comes to what I'm doing now, which is um, I'm more or less doing all of our diesel 92 day inspections, and we have 10 right now that are in service. Holy Whoa. crap! And then yeah, I'm also good for you. I'm, I'm also doing our COTNS schedule, um, and we have 28 cars and I'm tracking like all the out of service credit. I'm the one that does all of our inventory for our air brakes. I'll rebuild our small stuff, but I don't have time for the big stuff. Um, but I'm like all the ordering for the diesels, unless it's like a huge part that's going to cost, you know, like blowers, you know, um, the, the regular filters and just things you keep up on during 92 day. I, I keep up on all of our in inventory for that and air brakes. And so they've they've let me, because I'm very organized, my boss calls me the queen of organization. Um, and when we have a new area to develop, he's like, I want you to come up with how you think this should be laid out. So they've given me the freedom to organize and plan. And now I have a complete structure in place with uh, because I had to bring in my database development, of course, I have this whole structure in place where I can plop the dates into everything and automatically tell me when things are due. I can put in out of service credit, it'll automatically recalculate it for me. Um, and that applies for you know any coaches because HRA worked with the FRA to come up with um, out of service credit for coaches with older air brakes. So if they're not in revenue service for a whole month, then you get another month of service out of it without having to do your COTS. And that made a huge difference for us in some of our locations. We don't run for four months at Hiawassee and air brakes aren't cheap. So anyways, they've they've kind of let me take over the the scheduling and the inventory for our fleet in a, in a sense, but I'm also getting to do the annuals on the steam engines as part of the team. I'm not the only one doing it by, by any means, but I'm the one um, putting in all the data and making sure everything is stocked and working with my manager to be like, hey, we have like this month alone, I had five 92 days because we try and stagger them with out of service so that they don't all fall in one month. <laughs> and I was like, we gotta figure this out, man, because I got five of them now and North Pole Limited is right around the corner and we gotta figure all this uh -huh. out. So, <laughs> the transition from like not knowing anything mechanical to being completely mechanical is really what blows my mind sometimes and and I, I can like work on my car now and I can see something new and I'd be like well this has got to be this has to have a gasket oh yeah here it is I'm like what's being held there's got to be something holding it together oh yeah there it is and it's restructured my brain completely so that's the, the transition long-term transition those are the the kind of lifetime skills that you pick up that you don't think you're going to yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I think it's what makes everything worthwhile. Uh, and I, it really I, speaks to the support group mm -hmm. that you have. And yes, yeah, support from your coworkers, support from your management. It, it just shows how a, how a good group, a good organization, a good company can help you grow as a person, grow as an employee, uh, and be happy with what you're doing. My, uh, my inner Excel nerd is immensely excited by uh, the, the little bit of programming you were talking about. Uh, oh, we, yeah. we, we will That's... have to talk later more about that. 
when I was, uh, I smacked my, I, I was getting up on the front of the steam engine and I looked right at the headlight and I said, I will not, because the door was open. And I said, I will not stand up into the light. I will not hit my head on the light. And of course, what I do, muscle memory took over and I oh, stood yeah. straight up and I rammed the top of my head into the, the headlight. Well, then I jammed like my neck together and caused like some contusion. So I was on light duty for like three weeks. And uh, so I reorganized the office, but then I was like, I'm going to create a database of our entire fleet. So now if you put in like a certain locomotive, it'll tell you all the filters it has and whatever information I can randomly glean from it the next time I'm there. I'm like, oh yeah, it has these solenoids for the, the sanders and like, you know, just so that way, if something goes down with it, I can just pull it up and go grab what I need off the shelf without having to be like, what does that one have again? I don't remember. And uh, I'm picking away at it. It's not complete, but it's like my total nerd happy place when I'm in the office. I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can pick away at the database for an hour today. But that does have, that hasn't happened in like a year. I honestly, I haven't been able to touch it because we're so busy. <laughs> that is absolutely an amazing, incredible resource you're building. Um, and I, you know, I think Nick and I we've talked about this kind of briefly, but blending. Um, technology and bringing experience we have as young people with technology into what we do in organizations that usually aren't as technical um, for whatever reasons, you know, computer technical for whatever reasons mm -hmm. they may be. Um, I, I, I love that. A hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent. And uh, I've seen this happen at the uh, Danbury Railway Museum and even like I took a, a design design class i'm not great but um you know being able like last year and, and this year we have two visiting new york central cars and being able to import from the database of uh you know the historical um posters and being able to i'm actually looking one, at one on our wall in the office right now and being able to change that into you know christmas window on the naugatuck railroad and making it a modern cool retro poster uh, and being able to do that for some of our invitations and stuff like that. And you know, nobody here had ever done that. And then people are like, wow, that's really cool. To the fact where people in the gift shop are wanting to buy it. Uh, you know, that, that's a, a, you know, a, I would say a, a, general, a generational thing because Adobe, Adobe Illustrator, um, you know, what? Came out in the last, in the last 20 years. I, I remember having the Adobe Creative Suite number two on uh, 14 discs on my Windows 98 machine as a as a young lass that my dad had when he was in college. Um, but, you know, stuff like that's absolutely generational. Uh, and I, I, if you do sell those posters, I may have to swing by your gift shop on my way into, uh, into the railroad yeah. to pick one up. You're, yes, you're, you're always welcome. And that's, that's a, we can go down rabbit holes for hours, but that's another, uh, uh, you know, I think that even our gift shop has transitioned a lot here in the last you know when i took it over with uh, another gentleman you know it was a lot of the let's face it and i said this at my hra presentation what do you see in every railroad gift shop we could do bingo a wow toys <laughs> cheap plastic train set right everywhere mm -hmm. and i was like that's great you got to have your staple items but the, you don't really need to you got to diversify a railroad gift shop doesn't necessarily have to have railroad stuff. And that was a generational thing too, I, I think. Um, I brought brought some new ideas in, um, but also I talked to some of, you gotta be willing to broaden your atmosphere. And I think the gift shop's a great example of that. We have your winter hats, we have your modern, uh, we have flannel shirts now, no good with that oh. flannel shirt. Um, so we have a very diverse gift shop now, and I'll try it. There's some higher end items. Our most expensive gift shop item right now is $253, which is uh, some beautiful stuff from New Hampshire. Right? Never thought we would sell it. First weekend out, it sells. Yeah, and nobody would ever thought that this that, that was going to be the case. Even myself had doubts, and I kind of ordered it just to, as a decoration, <laughs> make it an eye catcher. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that was a generational thing. The, the the people that were running it before, you know, Myself and, and Stuart came along. Uh, you were older generation. You know, we're going to cater to what we think works well. And sometimes what you think works well is not the answer. 
and there's stuff in there that I had my doubts about too, but you got to be willing to listen and make those make those changes because um, you know generationally it's always changing. And I always say the only thing one of my famous favorite quotes is the only one of the only things constant in life is change. And if you have the chance to do something amazing, never pass up the opportunity. So if you put two of those together, you can, you're in for an interesting combination. I hadn't thought of gift shops as a place where um, youth can youth and that perspective could mm -hmm. provide a new point of view. But it's like, yeah, you know, when I go somewhere, like, I, you know, at my office we have a sticker wall, and you go away on vacation, you pick up a sticker, you, you buy something in the mail, you get a free sticker. It goes on the sticker wall at work, and you know, when I go somewhere, it's like I want a sticker, and you know, I was out at IRM and didn't see a sticker in the gift shop, and it's like I. I, I like I want a I want a cool sticker. I had some nice coffee mugs. Um, the flan right. the flannels got me. That's that's good. I like that. Mhm. Mm so it's it's diversifying and you know like it said that that's a great thing to come out of this tonight. You know, <laughs> your your gift shop can be generational too. And I think that example of like not having stickers now. You can buy stickers in our in our years. People, I mean, our, I see our NR stickers. I'm at the HRA conference. And people have it on their on their on their coffee mugs or their their travel thermoses, and it's kind of cool to see that. Oh, here we are in in uh, you know Montreal, and I'm not the only one that has an <laughs> NR you know sticker. Uh, it, it's it's pretty cool, and a lot of that has to do with advertising and connections, and um, that's something that Ricky and I touched base a lot about, and we'll be touching base more about like HRA a lot of the vendors and stuff at these at these conferences and rail organizations are ticket systems are mechanical are every tourist railroad in the country even BNSF railway in Fort Worth has a gift shop you know has a store and I think you know, diversifying in that nobody ever kind of reaches out to some of these new and aspiring vendors or thinks that huh the national park vendor might be a good person to bring into our railroad because of our because of our business and with the state park right up the street it's stuff like that yeah uh, and uh that's like i said that that's a rabbit hole but talk about generational your gift shop is i would argue is just as generational as the operation would be uh, I, I don't want to keep pontificating on gift shops too much, though I do love swag as much as the next person. Yes, no, uh, I'm sorry. But web, was, uh... are, are, do you have a web store set up for your gift shop? Because that's one uh, thing I wish that I saw in more places was um, web stores for the gift shops. Because, uh, you know, usually, you know, I got friends, I like to buy them Christmas presents and send them a little something and, you know, get, get them something from a railroad I know they like or a museum and they, um a non-profit to history organization and a lot of these places don't have gift shops that you have to go into our museum to get it um true. yeah that is true and we work with our ticket our current system is set up and we actually have the gift shop on the back on the back end they go live on the website and um of course we're right in the middle of trying to get ready for christmas oh how are we all yes and uh but, but but one thing with that is we once again we go back to having the right people and having enough people to make it happen is as I'm just trying to set it up and get ready to go live is finding out the fulfillment schedule and who's going to manage the emails and all this right in the middle of you know our, our, one of our busiest times of the year uh, because as you, the online market now if you order something you want it you want it now you know you want it in two or three or four days yeah uh, so you got to stay on top of that and i think that's a i think that's the downfall to a lot of railroad organizations is you know you, you almost have to have somebody that is is dedicated and is in line with that and uh, i'm working on that uh here in thomaston in our online gift shop hopefully we'll be live in the next few weeks but you know we we, we won't you know <laughs> It, it's uh, it's making sure that that plan is going to be absolutely executed well, and uh, for the people listening in, uh, you know, I'm sure take that back to your organizations. Uh, yeah, take definitely. That is uh, one of the. That's an excellent takeaway. Um, I, I love that. Oh. 
I do. I uh, 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 to the group here. I have. Um, I'm. I'm still in our our railroad office building, uh, and uh, uh, I, I can stay on it for a little bit longer. But I might need to transfer over to my cell phone. Um, um, soon, but I probably got time for a few more a few more questions um, on the actual computer server here. Um, so Hypno Games has a question: What does it take to find work in the railroading industry, and is it hard to do? Let's start with Ricky, since uh, that'll buy uh, buy Orion some time. <laughs> that depends on your definition of railroad industry. Uh, if you're talking about tourist railroad organizations, then it's a matter of finding whatever's closest to you and reaching out and finding out what their availability is like, what they're looking for. Are they looking for volunteers? Are they are they large enough to have paid staff? What are you looking to do? Um, some people require prior experience and some people don't. Um, I didn't have prior experience in mechanical, but they, I had a, a, an old license for operational, so they brought me back in and I got back into their testing for that. Um, if you're looking for more serious railroading, that's a whole other topic, but um, I, it's out there. It's just a matter of what's, what's near you, are they for-profit, non-profit? Um, and what's their structure like and what kind of work are they currently doing too that's a big one because someone's not always working on a steam engine maybe they're restoring a car maybe it's a trolley um, and they're looking for different types of work so it's it's going to be about your outreach and seeing what's what's near you and what's currently in motion at the at each one of those places And I don't think the work is hard, given the right support. Anyone can be taught anything. Anybody can do the work. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. I don't think the work is hard. Do I work really hard some days? I'm sweating profusely and I'm just totally exhausted? Sure. But um, the I work think, is I mean, is it hard to find, I mean, I could be misinterpreted. I, I took it as, is it hard to find work in the industry? Ah. It can be. It just it it be, depends sir. on where you live. If you're living in the middle of Pennsylvania, surrounded by like six different organizations, it might not be. But um, if you're out in, oh, I don't know, what's a good state North with nothing? More <laughs> Montana. You know, yeah. It, it yeah it depends on where you're at. Or in northwestern Pennsylvania, which is but, not the hub of rail preservation, <laughs> unlike pretty much any other part of Pennsylvania. Well, North you, Central's also pretty there, but... Not the, the 25 square mile area of northern East eastern-ish Pennsylvania? Well, yeah, I, there's there's that. That was an yeah. hour away from me, though. That was too hard to get to. Yeah. Uh, the, the Northeast Railroad Museum, which is a nice museum. Oh, no, I, I meant the, like, 25 square mile where there's the, the 13 railroads that all have steam engines and tourist ops right next oh, to each other oh, that that, one. yeah that's, yeah that's, that's yes, the that, other end of the state yeah. yes yes but i think it i don't think it's get it's hard i'm kind of an optimist when it comes to this i don't think it's hard to get into a place if you lay out what you're looking for and you have an open discussion with what they're looking for and finding out if that's a good match and um going from there um i have I haven't really seen anybody turn away unless you're like, you walk in and you're like, I'd like to run the steam engines, please. And they're like, okay, you have a nice day. Um, because that's all you show up saying that you're willing to do. Because <laughs> we literally just had somebody drive into our shop this week and they were like, here's my resume. I would like to run your steam engines. And that's, that's all they had. And we were very surprised. And we were like, well not quite how that works here but we appreciate you <laughs> so yeah it all lots of consideration for different things there uh you know it's, it's kind of our favorite saying amongst the friend group uh just go do the thing if you find a place and 
seems like a good fit. Go go do the thing and have fun doing it. I think that's the, the best way of putting it. But to sum it up to a single phrase. Um and Wobblebee twelve forty two writes, I'd like I'd really like to volunteer at my local museum slash restoration shop, but I really don't want to get treated like crap for being trans. I hear you. I agree. Yes. All the things. Oh god, that's loaded. Um very. Yeah, uh it's uh being uh in the LGBTQ community is incredibly tough right now. Um I I understand. And uh I I can empathize and um you know, there's there's a lot of good places out there that'll really surprise you. Um, and I wish I could say I know what all those places are, and I, I know the places around me that are LGBTQ friendly, and um, it was wonderful during Pride Month this year driving in to go run at 6, 7 in the morning and pulling in at the start of June, and or start of July, start of June. And seeing pride flags out on the platform for the first time ever, um, knowing that it was a safe place well before then, but seeing that publicly displayed, and I wish more places would be like that, so that way more of us in the LGBTQ plus community could feel comfortable going places and getting involved. Um, I, I wish you the best finding a place, um, and uh, cool. yeah, I, I, I really don't know how much what else to say about that. I, I empathize I, and I understand. I I know what to say. I, I think I think now is a good time to introduce uh, our audience to the thing that. Oh, do you do you want to plug the thing? I, I want to plug the thing. I want to plug the thing, um, which also our guests uh, have some awareness of uh, too. And the thing is something that I hope can in the long run address a lot of uh, your questions and, and concerns that you've been bringing to us. Uh, the thing is called Next Generation Railroaders. It's a nonprofit organization that's in very early days at the moment. So you kind of it's a watch this space type of thing, but a nonprofit organization with the mission of connecting people into rail preservation on a volunteer front on a career front that is something that uh, is the the mission it's this is the first national nonprofit in rail preservation sphere that's mission is based around the development of people it's not about equipment or history and those are good missions but this is about people and developing people we're putting this together um the the there's we, there's a number of educational components that we see to it and networking components, but the one that I, I love to tell people about is what we're calling the Certified Mentor Program, which is where we will... Uh, so anybody could become a member of any age, but people uh, between the ages of 18 and 45 can apply to be connected with a mentor who has gone through a background check and training. Um, they and uh, NGR works to pair that applicant with a mentor and help them based on geography, uh, skills that they bring, skills they want to develop, um, what type of operations they'd like to be involved with, all these factors. And so that. Uh, way then people are, are growing in this the fields that they want to grow in um so that is something that and i bring this up at this point as to say that per what i was ranting about earlier about uh, how much i feel strongly about um making rail preservation um on a national front more inclusive and inviting um we are going to make diversity training part of of the uh are part of the training process for certified mentors. Um, we want to make sure that there is, uh, and we are going to be very out there saying that we see our organization is developing all people who want to have their skills developed. So our hope is that, um, so specifically uh, for folks like Wobblebee who want to ensure that they are being connected 
into an environment that will be accepting of them are certified mentors they need to be accepting but that that is a criteria absolutely in my mind um so watch this space but that's something that I'm super stoked about, and I look forward to presenting more on that in the coming months, um, including how all of you guys can be part of that. So stay tuned on that. Uh, if, uh, oh, thank you, Flying Scotsman fan. I'm glad you think that sounds really cool. Um, yes, uh, and Ninja Cat um, it is uh, it putting in some notes in the chat too, which I appreciate. Uh, getting uh, a lot of we have to get this up and that up and running but watch uh, this space or... I am I am proud to be involved in it and uh, I look forward to helping create this wonderful organization and move move the industry forward get get more young people involved get them into places that are safe and get uh, you know help help organizations grow and become better spaces um, I believe we're gonna yeah, Rudy's, uh, Rudy's saying that now we're going to pin the uh, NGR website over in the VRA server, uh, Discord server. And uh, if you're not already in the server, question mark, Discord, or explanation mark, Discord in chat should trigger the bot to uh, bring up the Discord link. So you can join the server and you can find the link there after the stream ends. And you certainly, I, I hope that both... Uh, once we get the, the CM program up and running, that both of our guests uh, become certified mentors because they would be excellent at that. I would love to. I need to get. I need to get moved. <laughs> well, this is. Lot, we got I, a lot of stuff know, too. This is not an immediate. We've, thing. we've talked about before, but I'm like, I'm all for it. I just, uh, I gotta get settled. But then I think that's. I think it's a great idea. I really do. And, yeah. Be it's uh, like, like I said, the <laughs> multiple times and, you know, the you know, pe people change, change is a constant and organizations need to be, be adaptive and, and, and willing. And I, I think that's part of what, you know, uh, the younger, I would say the, the younger generation has, has done a good, you know, done a good job on. And uh, it sounds like uh, with this, uh, uh, organization coming to be, uh, you know, I think it can only help grow the industry, um, you know, in the, in the youth, and I think that's great. Sorry, I'm, I'm troubleshooting on the back end with the Discord link. Okay. Um, well, well, you... <laughs> being, you being, being tech support right now. Yeah. I probably, uh, I, I, I hate, I hate to cut myself over to the phone, but, um, as I'm sitting here in, in the in the in the in the company office, uh, I, I can probably take one or two more um, um, questions. Uh, not not I, I don't mean to rush it along. No, it's uh, uh, it's been a long day. No, I, I mean, uh, understandable. And we are stream, anyway. yeah, we we are coming up towards the end. Um, shall we? You know, I I have a in our pre-made questions. If we don't have any more from the uh, from the chat, um, got a couple of uh pre-made ones we can use our did we get through all the chat questions nick yeah we're up on the chat questions um so i you know i'm just gonna jump to my big ticket closer um what advice do you guys have for someone young starting out and getting involved like what, what, what would you say to to younger not necessarily younger you but what would you say to someone just getting involved in it all um well, I would for for me it's going to be very simple. I, you, meaning the younger person, has to be willing to make the first move. As I stated earlier, the organizations aren't going to drop into your inbox. You have to be willing to to be able to reach out. I think that that is key, and um, patience. It, it's instant success is not going to happen overnight. And sometimes, and even more so in, in Ricky's case, it, it was an uphill battle to get there. And it, some people won't have as difficult a time. Some people might have a more difficult time than Ricky and I combined. But if it's something you're passionate about and you want to stick with it, stick with it. But, you know, never lose sight of your willingness to stick with it. 
um, it's kind of a loaded, a loaded saying, but it, it's not, it's not easy. It's not going to get handed to you. And depending on your area and your organization, sometimes you have to be, uh, stay on top of them and be that person that's willing to make the noise to make the changes. And, uh, I think that I attribute a lot of, uh, Railroad Museum of New England success to that and we've had a lot of change and there's pains of changing and, and growing and uh, but it, it it's already showing it's for the better and uh, you know I look forward to seeing what the future brings for for us here and seeing what new faces uh, you know we just announced the steam locomotive project here and I look forward to seeing what kind of interest that brings not only to our own people but maybe the community um, people that might not, might not necessarily be trained people. And for the people that are leaders of organizations listening in, you know, find that niche project, find that thing that will continue to bring new energy and new life into your organization. Breach. <laughs> Snaps. How do I follow that? <laughs> you know, I almost made a I almost made a comment when we first started. I was like, man, I don't want to follow him. Like he just you're just so eloquent. Um, my advice is that you only have one life. You need to follow your heart and follow your passion. Don't let people drag you down. Um, just show up and do the work. Like I, it doesn't how many matter how many people told me I couldn't. Um, I showed up and I did the work and when I was given special opportunities a lot of people made fun of me and used me being female as the reason um, but they didn't know that I was showing up and doing the work on the back end and that's why I was like you know shout out getting to run the 4449 for a photo run by I was showing up when I was a kid to the shop with Doyle and um people just assumed it was because I was female and you just you can't let it don't let things get to you um, as best you can show up do the work don't care what they think and it might take a while obviously like I'm 37 and it's taken this long to get to a point where I'm completely content with where I'm at and uh I'm not making as much money as I was programming, and I'm happier than I ever have been. So, um, yeah, I think the same could be said about all aspects of your life, like relationships too. Um, but yeah, follow follow your heart and don't give up. That was both of you absolutely beautiful, and the more I hear about what each of you do, the more I. Like I, we gotta meet up in person, grab some hard cider, and sit down and just talk. Um, yeah. If I'm, I just I, I, love. I love hearing you guys talk about what you do and how you've helped your organizations and all the cool stuff you've done in the past. I, I, I love it when my, when a guest on the show blow me away. And um, uh, yeah. I, Nick, do you have anything else? Y'all have been great. This has been fun. This yeah. This is Good. this absolutely a fun time. Um, if you guys can make it, if you can make it to HRA, you know, and talking about hard, hard cider and drinks, you know, there's always an after party. Uh, well, you know, you know there, if you're going to twist my arm like year, that. We had a great, we had a great can I, group. I had to, can, Ryan, can I rat you out? About, oh, like, yeah, go for speaking it. Sure. Of, speak, speaking of friendships that have blossomed is this HRA, uh, Orion was staying at a different hotel and we were... Uh, at the banquet, or well, not the banquet, but anyways, inside with vendors and whatnot, one of the meetings, and they have drinks. And uh, we got to a point where we weren't sure he was going to make it back to his hotel by himself. So a group of us walked him back to his room and uh, made sure he was in his room. And then one of our other friends that I met loaded him up with a bunch of waters and left him in the bathroom, like all loaded up all the cups in the room of waters. And it was just like, a total bonding moment over you know when we would have never met otherwise said from hra i think well no oh yeah no because my went to uh visit y'all through another convention but i can't remember what that was ah that was the one i met i didn't i didn't get chosen to work on that one 
<laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, so. And, and uh, to throw it back out, you, Ricky, I'm surprised some of you made it back to your hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're old and experienced with drinking, so <laughs> we've been drinking at HRA conventions for a long time. It is a skill at those uh, at those to be able to keep yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Now that's not what all HRA is about. But no, it's, it's not. That, it's that, not. But talking about networking, sometimes the best the best networking and friendships are made at the you know at the bar down the road after the presentations are done. Hundred percent. In, yeah. in every industry, that's where all the networking mm -hmm. is done. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. We no, absolutely thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Love this topic, um, and you know. Nick and I are very passionate about it, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it more soon at some point in the near future on the show again. Um, if not the show, definitely in the Discord, definitely probably at some point on the Roundhouse podcast. Um, <laughs> shameless plug. People are, people are free. I, I got Facebook. I'm generally pretty accepting. If I, I, I vaguely know you, I'll accept the request. If you're listening in, um, you know, please, if any, any other questions... I'm really busy at this time of year, but you know I'll do my best to get back to anybody. Um, you know, and uh, I think uh, a plug to TBRM. You know, if you don't follow them, give them a follow. And you know, to the Naugatuck Railroad and the Railroad Museum of New England. You know, we got some cool things going on too over here. Yes, and, I will. Uh, yeah. You know, I was going to say, I will plug both of the websites in the VRA Discord as well, so that way you can go check out both of these guys' wonderful operations, go visit them, ride the train, buy the merch from the web store or in person. Um, and yeah, to go out and do the thing and get involved, do the thing and have fun. I don't yep. think we can do put it thing. any other way. <laughs> All right. As always, I'm Professor Casey. And I'm Professor Dick. And thank you so much for tuning in this evening. Later. Good night. Yep, good night. Bye. Night.